Good morning, everyone. So uh, before, I mean, our guests are taking their place <coughs> on the podium. Uh, first, I would like to to thank uh, our chief guest, uh, the director of public prosecution, Kenya, who authorized us to to swap. I mean, our presentation from yesterday to this morning. So yesterday, uh, you have all been very busy and tired by the end of the afternoon. So that's the reason why, very kindly, uh, DPP Kenya authorized us to swap this presentation. This presentation will take place in two different languages. Uh, for the institutional presentation, it will be in French, and for the operational part, it will be in English. So now we'll start in, in French. So you, if you have the time to pick up your headsets. Do we have the presentation? OK. Monsieur le procureur général du Kenya, puisqu'il n'y a pas d'équivalent en, en français pour euh, traduire le DPP, mesdames et messieurs les procureurs généraux près les cours de cassation, les cours d'appel, euh, bonjour, bienvenue à cette euh, petite présentation du projet AML CFT Escape. This is a name that is very complicated with so many abbreviations, and uh, I've always been told about it, but it's a program um, that is uh, there to fight against uh, the finance, terrorism financing and also money laundering. le projet couvrait 10 pays, l'Est de l'Afrique, et puis lors de la première euh, plénière de l'ESAMLAG euh, à laquelle nous avons assisté en 2019, six pays observateurs nous ont rejoints. Au vu des résultats qu'on va rapidement vous présenter, eh bien la l'Union européenne a décidé d'élargir le programme, de lui donner un autre nom, de lui donner un autre, une autre couverture géographique, mais toujours avec la même mission qui sera de lutter contre les flux financiers illicites générés par la criminalité transnationale organisée. Ce pays, ce pays, ce projet, pardon, qui couvre maintenant 34 pays, est en fait une phase de transition, puisque dans 18 à 20 mois à peu près, c'est la durée de ce projet, ce projet sera remplacé par une phase numéro 4, qui cette, cette fois va couvrir 
toute l'Afrique, les 54 pays de l'Afrique et probablement le Yémen. Je reviens un instant sur le Yémen parce que vous allez me dire que fait le Yémen dans votre couverture géographique. Eh bien, c'est tout simplement parce que en 2015, quand nous avons lancé la phase 1, euh, à cette époque-là, la lutte contre le blanchiment d'argent et le financement du terrorisme était beaucoup moins développée que maintenant. Et il n'y avait personne pour euh, s'occuper du Yémen qui, à l'époque, faisait face à une terrible situation euh, de guerre civile. Donc depuis, comme ils ont toujours été loyaux et ont toujours assisté avec beaucoup d'envie à nos activités, c'est la raison pour laquelle à chaque fois on les a inscrits dans notre couverture géographique. Voilà pour le Yémen. Donc on va passer à, sur la diapositive suivante, next slide please, euh, sur les objectifs qui ont été euh, réalisés au cours des trois années du projet précédent. Can we have the next slide, please? Je vais n'en citer que quelques-uns parce que, effectivement, on a fait, euh, grâce à l'engouement, grâce à la détermination des différentes institutions avec lesquelles nous, a travaillé, nous avons travaillé, nous sommes allés beaucoup plus loin que ça. Mais à titre d'exemple, c'est juste un, un petit exemple, en trois ans, on a réussi à former plus de 6 000, 6 000 vous avez bien entendu, euh, participants. Et ça, ce n'est pas nous, c'est tout simplement l'engouement, comme je le disais à l'instant, des pays avec lesquels on a travaillé. Et quand je dis les pays, je devrais plutôt préciser en disant les institutions. Donc, voilà. Bon, 5 636 pour être exact. Euh, non, c'est slide, previous slide, please. Ensuite, on a participé avec certains pays, notamment le Kenya. Alors, le Kenya est euh, parmi les premiers pays euh, que nous avons euh, soutenus, que ce soit la FIU, la, le Centre de renseignement financier du Kenya, ou euh, que ce soit les Donc on a également participé et soutenu la rédaction de directives au Kenya, actuellement avec nos partenaires de, du Mozambique, du Mozambique pardon, de, mais ça viendra aussi pour le Mozambique, de Tanzanie, nous sommes également présents avec eux pour les aider à la rédaction de ces directives en matière de coordination des enquêtes financières dans un but de lutte contre le terrorisme et le financement du terrorisme. Donc ça c'est quelque chose de très important parce que ça va être souligné tout à l'heure, c'est on agit essentiellement, uniquement, dans le cadre des 40 recommandations et des 11 résultats immédiats du GAFI. C'est un projet, somme toute, GAFI. Alors, euh, vous allez me dire, pourquoi nous adressons-nous au, euh, au parquet et aux instances judiciaires Tout simplement parce que vous savez bien mieux que quiconque que sans un bon contrôle, sans un bon, une, be une bonne coordination des services du parquet, un dossier ne sera pas remis sur le bureau du juge dans de bonnes conditions. 
Et là, on fait offense à personne. Parce que conduire des enquêtes, c'est un métier. Diriger des enquêtes au niveau du parquet, c'est un autre métier. Collecter les informations financières dans le but de transmettre ces informations au parquet, c'est un autre métier. Et euh, également, il y a un travail très important de coordination avec les services de recouvrement des avoirs criminels, des, des, des services de lutte anti-corruption, et puis, euh, tout au bout de, de la chaîne, je l'ai dit, le, les magistrats du siège. Alors, pourquoi les magistrats du siège d'un côté et euh, les magistrats du parquet de l'autre Simplement parce que, à l'origine, ce projet était essentiellement sous le common law, et dans le common law, effectivement, le judiciaire, la magistrature du siège est complètement indépendante du, du parquet. Voilà. Euh, notre approche est, est essentiellement institutionnelle dans le sens où on s'adresse d'abord aux institutions euh, qui sont, euh, on va dire, les, les plus en vue en matière de lutte contre le blanchiment d'argent et le financement du terrorisme. J'en ai cité cinq. C'est les cinq que le résultat immédiat numéro 7 du GAFI nous commande de soutenir et euh, d'aider à se coordonner. Ces cinq institutions, ben, vous les connaissez, ça commence par euh, les centres de renseignement financiers, les services d'enquête judiciaire, j'insiste sur la séparation des deux, le parquet bien évidemment, et c'est euh, là euh, où je m'adresse à vous, les services euh, judiciaires également, et bien entendu, je l'ai cité tout à l'heure, les agences de recouvrement des avoirs criminels, et ainsi que les agences de lutte anticorruption, qui jouent un rôle clé en matière de lutte contre le financement du terrorisme et le blanchiment d'argent. Donc, je l'ai dit, on est passé de 10 plus 6 maintenant à 34 pays. Dans 18 mois, 20 mois, 54 pays. Vous imaginez bien que la structure du projet a dû évoluer. Donc, nous avons changé d'équipe, nous avons changé la structure d'équipe, et euh, aussi, nous avons changé notre façon de travailler, parce qu'avant, nous travaillions en zone euh, quasiment exclusivement anglophone, à part Djibouti, à part ensuite les Comores et Madagascar. Mais maintenant, euh, nous avons un tiers de nos pays euh, qui sont euh, francophones. Donc nous avons une structure bicéphale avec une partie francophone et une partie anglophone dans notre projet, mais on n'oublie pas non plus euh, les partenaires qui sont dans le, euh, la FSRB euh, de le, du MENAFETAF, Middle East and North Africa Countries euh, Association, et non plus dans nos, nos amis du euh, JABA, même si on n'a que deux pays, euh, que je voudrais citer, c'est Sao Tomé et Principe, et ce sont les Comores. Euh, les autres sont essentiellement en, anglophones, comme vous pouvez l'imaginer, et c'est la raison pour laquelle on, on s'est structuré, structuré en deux départements euh, bien distincts. Alors, je l'ai dit, pour s'adresser à 34 pays en même temps, parce que, faites le calcul, 5 institutions par pays par 34 euh, pays, ça fait 170 interlocuteurs. Donc si on faisait par exemple une semaine de formation dans un pays, eh bien, on n'aurait pas assez de la durée de notre mandat total pour euh, développer notre projet. Donc on s'appuie, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, sur les institutions, mais également sur une approche géographique et aussi sur une approche institutionnelle régionale. C'est-à-dire que on a noué des partenariats avec les institutions régionales déjà en place et bien établies. Euh, il y en a, a quelques-unes dans la salle, notamment euh, l'IGAD, euh, l'ONUDC. Je veux dire, euh, on a travaillé en partenariat, bien entendu, avec l'agence régionale, euh, l'association régionale des agences d'avoir criminel, les ARIN, euh, de l'Est de l'Afrique et du Sud de l'Afrique. 
bientôt de l'ouest de l'Afrique. Et j'espère, avec, avec votre concours, euh, nous organisons exactement le même genre de forum à Maurice dans un mois et demi, où là, nous allons euh, inviter vos collègues, les directeurs d'agences de recouvrement des avoirs criminels. Bon, on fera exactement la même présentation, car notre approche est une approche multi-agence, et l'idée est d'avoir un effet maximum en passant par ces euh, partenariats régionaux. Je l'ai oublié de citer, enfin je ne l'ai pas oublié, mais je veux dire, comme on travaille avec les instances de police judiciaire, on va travailler avec Interpol de la même manière que si on travaille en matière financière, on va travailler avec les FSRB compétentes, on en a quatre dans notre scope géographique, et on va également travailler avec les unités, euh, les associations, entre guillemets, judiciaires ou du parquet, compétentes dans cette zone géographique. Nous allons essentiellement nous euh, focaliser sur, quand on va faire nos, nos formations régionales, on va inviter vos représentants, car si aujourd'hui on s'adresse euh, au plus haut niveau de la hiérarchie, euh, du, du parquet. On va également s'adresser au plus haut niveau de la hiérarchie des agences de recouvrement des avoirs criminels, je l'ai dit. On l'a fait il y a 15 jours en s'adressant au chef des centres de renseignement financier, au chef des services d'immigration et au chef des services de police judiciaire. Donc c'est une approche, comme je disais, euh, multi-agence, où vous, procureur euh, avait un rôle absolument essentiel et critique de validation des enquêtes, de la collecte d'informations, j'irai même de la collecte de renseignements, parce que quand on parle d'économie de, 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 et de, de finances, on parle de renseignements financiers. Et donc, c'est important de mentionner que nous cherchons à avoir votre appui, votre coordination, et quand nous allons organiser des activités de formation, soit au régional, soit en local, chez vous, euh, ça sera bien sûr avec euh, l'appui des parquets, puisque vous serez au centre, vraiment au centre de euh, l'enquête qui euh, concernera ces réseaux de blanchiment d'argent et de financement terrorisme. Voilà, c'est la partie institutionnelle que je voulais euh, mentionner, que je voulais euh, souligner, parce que, bien sûr, on s'adresse aux chefs d'institution, parce que sans l'aval, sans votre aval, sans votre euh, consentement, je veux dire, il n'y a pas possibilité de toucher vos euh, collaborateurs et, bien entendu, les unités qui sont en charge techniquement et opérationnellement du terrain. C'est ce que nous allons voir dans une ou deux minutes. Voilà, j'ai terminé avec ma présentation euh, euh, institutionnelle. Je vais laisser la parole à Alma, euh, Alma Oyama, qui est euh, une de mes senior technical advisors du projet. Euh, et euh, nous allons repasser en langue anglaise. Merci de votre attention. Thank you, Fred. My name is uh, Alma Wanyama. I'm a senior technical advisor with the AML CFT SK project. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, that was a, a presentation about our project by our project director, Mr. Frederick Bayard. And we've done some uh, work with the prosecution offices in the region. Uh, in the panel, we have Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, who um, like to call them to just give a brief experience of how the project has supported the prosecution service. And they each have uh, two minutes or, or one and a half. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Michael Sang uh, from ODPP Kenya. 
I'll be very brief. I understand uh, running against time. Um, we have worked, uh, as ODPP Kenya, we have worked very closely with uh, the EU, uh, AML, uh, THB project at the time. Right now, uh, it's EU, AML, CFT, SK project. Um, the kind of support that we've received uh, over the past year uh, include multi-agency trainings uh, with, with, with stakeholders, uh, law enforcement, within law enforcement, uh, in the criminal justice system, just to mention one. Okay, thank you. Um, we have had also trainer of trainer programs uh, where some ODPP uh, Kenya staff have been certified as TOTs uh, by the project. We have also had uh, specific and targeted trainings on financial investigation and um, on, on, on uh, evidence collection, uh, that nature of training. Uh, right here, actually we had that last year uh, here in the South Coast in Diani, about 70, 70 prosecutors from ODPP Kenya benefited from that training. Uh, we also have a lot of ongoing support uh, by the EU on drafting uh, a financial investigation uh, training uh, curriculum. When we are discussing illicit financial uh, flows, uh, training is something that is essential to impart knowledge to our prosecutors, uh, among other capacity building uh, engagements. Uh, one of the key things I would like to mention is the interagency guidelines that the first speaker alluded to. Uh, we were able uh, to come up with uh, interagency guidelines on cooperation and collaboration uh, in the investigation and prosecution of terrorism and terrorism financing. Uh, this was launched uh, last year in Kenya uh, on Tuesday, uh, 12th uh, April 2022. That is last year under the leadership of uh, DPP Kenya. Um, we also have some support, uh, and, and just to, to testify once more uh, on this kind of partnership with EU and the support. Today we are in uh, Mombasa, and uh, we, we, we have had a, a lot of their support in, 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 in trying to uh, uh, organize and, and, and ensure the success of this 16th uh, AGM. Uh, of, of uh, African Prosecutors Association. Uh, finally, I would just like to point out that uh, EU is also working closely with uh, ODPP Tanzania, and I had a, a rare opportunity uh, last week to share Kenya's uh, experience in coming up with interagency guidelines uh, with our counterparts uh, from Tanzania. I know uh, Mr. Faraja Chimbi is the next speaker, and he will uh, speak to this. Uh, but we had a very, very su successful engagement uh, in Tanzania. And these are some of the things that I would just like to point out uh, also for the, for the other 34 countries that are coming, uh, 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 that are working now, or will be working with the project uh, moving forward. That the partnership uh, is very important and uh, essential uh, in the fight against illicit financial uh, flows. So it's important uh, Mr. Faraja Chimbi would would uh, associate, I think, with my remarks. We had a very successful uh, engagement in Tanzania last week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, good morning, everyone. Yes, I am uh, Farajan Chimbi, um, Acting Director, um, Asset Forfeiture from the National Prosecution Services, Tanzania. Yeah, as we all know, uh, the National Prosecution Services of the United Republic of Tanzania for quite some time has been undertaking initiatives geared towards uh, uh, combating transnational organized crime with a specific focus on uh, anti-money laundering initiatives, counter-terrorism, and the counter-financing of terrorism. Over the time, uh, we took it upon ourselves to assess the way we have been conducting our businesses insofar as the areas that I've mentioned is concerned. And we came to a realization that uh, despite of all the initiatives that have been undertaken so far with the 
um, amendment of the legislation and uh, all other initiatives, still we are engaged with the challenge of uh, having an efficient and effective mechanism of ensuring interagency collaboration at national and international level. It is at this point that the Director of Public Prosecutions of the United Republic of Tanzania found it upon himself to be imperative to look around and list, and list assistance from various international agencies and organizations so that at least we can be supported in uh, the area of uh, putting in place some tools that would assist in ensuring collaboration and cooperation among agencies both at the national and international level. And that is where last year uh, we came in touch with the uh, ALMA, the technical specialist of the uh, SK project. We engaged her and uh, the director and informed her about uh, the need of the URT to have in place some tools that will assist in ensuring collaboration among the law enforcement agencies. Uh, with gratitude, the project accepted our request and they agreed to provide us with support in various areas. And so far, we have embarked upon the development of the guidelines for collaboration and cooperation among the law enforcement agencies in Tanzania. As Michael pointed, from the 23rd to 27th this month, the project uh, assisted uh, the coordination and the facilitation of a workshop where a number of practitioners from different law enforcement agencies in Tanzania met together for five days, deliberating and discussing on issues that impedes our effectiveness in uh, countering money laundering, uh, terrorism, and the counterfinancing of terrorism. And uh, through that workshop and uh, with the support and the experience that we gathered from our colleague Michael, who flew all the way from Kenya to join us in Tanzania, we have already managed to develop the zero draft of the guidelines. And uh, we expect to have uh, another three upcoming workshops by the support of Alma and the director Frederick under the project. And uh, we believe by the end of May, we are going to have a set of these guidelines ready for utilization. And uh, we so much believe that hey, with these guidelines in place, to a great extent, we are going to improve. We are going to improve the quality of investigations in areas of uh, uh, counterterrorism and the counterfinancing of terrorism, as well as uh, money laundering. But also, to a great extent, we believe with, with this set of guidelines that brings together all law enforcement agencies together, uh, then we are going to have an increased number of uh, uh, parallel investigations in areas that relates to financial investigation. Uh, all this attribute goes to the, to the project. And uh, so far, uh, and I would plea uh, with you, Mr. Frederick and, uh, and Alma, is we embark upon uh, um, our, our jurisdictions after the completion of this meeting. Uh, the National Prosecution Services um, is uh, thinking of going to hold a symposium of all prosecutors of the National Prosecution Services in Tanzania whose number uh, for now is approximately about 600. We intend to bring together all these prosecutors in a symposium that, among other things, is going to have an in-depth discussion of all the pertinent issues that have been discussed in this forum, because it will make no meaning if we sit here, two delegations from each, each country, and we, go, we don't get the chance to share what we had discussed here at the national level to all the prosecutors. So we, we intend to have this symposium. Also, in this symposium, we are going to have uh, an in-depth discussion about the guidelines that are still under development, uh, expecting, to, expecting to draw some inputs from these prosecutors in order to, in order to, to enrich the, the document. So again, at this point, I find it pertinent to, to play with you so that at least we enlist your support in making sure that this, uh, this symposium becomes becomes a reality. With that few remarks, I think uh, I've said enough, given the time that has been allocated, and let me pass over the mic to my colleague from Uganda so that she can also share her experience in the area. Thank you very much.
Uh, good morning to you all. My name is Vicky Navisenke. I'm an assistant DPP from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, Uganda. I head the Department of International Cooperation. Uh, just like my colleagues from Kenya and Tanzania, uh, Uganda has interfaced with uh, the project AML uh, City. CTF, yes, to, to their financing or funding. They are one of our key funders for the upcoming 10th annual general meeting of the East African Association of Prosecutors. Uh, this uh, general meeting and conference is going to be held in Uganda, hosted by the DPP Uganda, the Honorable Lady Justice Jane Francis Abodo. And it will bring together all the member countries of the East African Association of Prosecutors. We are 11 in total. That is Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, DRC, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Zambia, Malawi, and Mozambique. So it is uh, because of this project that we have been able to host or we will be able to host this meeting at the end of this month. The meeting will be held on 26th February to 2nd March 2022 in Kampala. So on behalf of the ODPP Uganda, I want to thank the project for the funding and also invite them to engage with us equally in coming up with guidelines uh, for interagency cooperation and coordination because uh, in this forum we are strengthening cooperation and collaboration on the regional level. But sometimes we lack coordination within our domestic countries. So if we build these networks and then within the country, you cannot, one institution cannot help the other to, to offer the adequate help needed by another country, we may not be so effective. So we believe that if you work with us and we build our systems within the countries to cooperate and coordinate better, then we will have achieved the purposes of these regional gatherings. We have the Prosecutors Academy in DPP. We have the systems, the departments for corrupt and corruption. We have a, a division on asset recovery a department on uh, ICD, International Crimes Department, dealing with terrorism. So we'll be happy to work with you more and any other funders out there. We thank you. I thank you to our panelists. And also to mention that uh, Uganda has also certified uh, experts uh, at the prosecution. You have uh, gold certified experts by the project who are trainers. They went through the TOT. Oh, because of time, um, I will not open this to plenary, but I'll invite the delegates from the 34 countries the project is covering to talk to us during any of the breaks. Myself, Frederick, um, our team member, uh, Madam Gaia, who is seated will be uh, available to answer any question and to give guidance. Thank you so much for the audience. Sorry, sorry. Just one word. Um, in order to activate the project, uh, your institutions, they have to uh, go through the EU delegations because this project, even is a EU project, yes, but without the EU delegations, uh, we can't do anything. We can't be activated officially because uh, our bosses in Brussels need the input of the EU delegation. So should you have any specific need, then please uh, get in touch with your respective uh, EU delegation so that uh, we have the right channel and uh, your request will be uh, I mean, uh, processed uh, in the best manner. Thank you for your attention. And again, thank you, Sir Director of Public Prosecution Kenya, 
for giving us the opportunity to present the project. And as, as, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, as Alma, sorry, as mentioned, we are ready in the room to answer any of your questions uh, that uh, you would uh, maybe have concerning the project or his future. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Frederick, Miss um, um, uh, Alma, and the teams from Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Thank you very much. Um, it's now my honor to invite the DPP uh, to uh, invite uh, Mweshmiwa. Thank you so much. Akaribu sana, DPP. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my colleagues. Um, I hope uh, you had a wonderful um, evening and you're enjoying uh, Mombasa, uh, that we also had uh, fruitful deliberations yesterday. Um, this morning, before this, the opening of the second session, um, we have, I have the honor of uh, inviting uh, a very important uh, um, gentleman. In Kenya, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions is uh, an independent office. However, it reports to two institutions, um, one of which oversights us, and that is Parliament. Um, in today, later in the afternoon, in the afternoon when we're in the evening when we are closing the session. We'll also have the honor of hosting uh, the Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, who will come and close the session for, for us. Uh, but within Parliament, we have uh, um, a committee called um, the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee, which is uh, actually uh, the, the committee within Parliament that oversights um, the justice sector. Uh, and uh, most, more specifically, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. So uh, this is uh, one of my bosses uh, that I report to in Parliament. Uh, and uh, uh, we um, asked him um, kindly to come and open this uh, session. Um, so I have the honor now, the singular honor of inviting Honorable Murugara George Kitonga, the chairperson, National Assembly Justice and Legal Affairs Committee. Thank you. Welcome, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry, it's not on. I think this is working. Thank you very much, um, the DPP of the Republic of Kenya, Mr. Nurdin Haji. Um, all protocol observed including the DPPs from the rest of uh, the countries that are represented here, their deputies and the other prosecutors. Uh, good morning. I was here and greeted you the other time and introduced myself as George Gitonga Murugara, Member of Parliament for the Raka constituency, which is found in the Rakanivi County, the eastern region of Kenya, and I sit in the National Assembly being one of the houses of parliament in Kenya. The other house of parliament in Kenya is the Senate, and thus our parliament comp is composed of two chambers, the National Assembly and the Senate. Uh, I'm here today as the chairman of the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee of the National Assembly to represent that committee in welcoming you into our country and also to wish you a very good stay here and very fruitful deliberations in all the matters that we'll be delving into. As the DPP of the Republic has hinted or stated, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in the country is an independent office. It is an office that under our Constitution is not subject to direction from anyone else, 
in the country apart from itself. The only issue it has is to account itself to parliament and thus by so doing and by making regular reports to parliament its independence is actually guaranteed. As a member of parliament uh, what we do especially under justice and legal affairs is to oversight this independent office of the DPP and we oversight by first and foremost having their budget line approved by parliament and then after that we receive from them the periodical reports which state the kind of work they are doing in the country and if there are any issues then the office of the DPP is actually answerable to parliament. It is very important <clears throat> uh, to have a seminar such as this one in which all the DPPs of the association, the Africa uh, Prosecutors Association, uh, come together so that you are able to discuss cross-cutting issues, especially across the borders. It's very clear <clears throat> that uh, unless there is cooperation between the various countries, between the various offices, the work of uh, combating crime in the continent may actually not be as successful as it should be. And this is the reason why such an association is very important in that when it comes to cross-cutting issues, whether relating to law, whether relating to um, apprehension of uh, suspects or any other relevant matter, then the countries are able to cooperate and any suspects and criminals are likely to be brought to book. Now, uh, I came over yesterday after the f this seminar was actually opened by His Excellency the President because he also had to open hours the other side of town in a different hotel which is also under an association known as the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Uh, so when I came in, I found you engaged in very useful topics and discussion, and I spent quite a bit of time with you here, as a result of which I learned especially on the issues that are of mutual interest to all of you. Issues including crimes that are international, which cut across which crimes must be fought at all costs because they affect all nationalities that are involved, including drug trafficking, money laundering, cyber crimes, um, etc., etc. These are crimes which, in their own nature, are peculiar in that they cut across countries. Uh, <clears throat> you have also to deal with possibly how to get these uh, persons, these criminals, through extraditions and uh, uh, such other judicial processes. And this, unless there is cooperation between countries, then you may have difficulties in having such criminals taken to countries where they are wanted for trial. Asset recovery is another one because some of these assets you have to recover are proceeds of crime, whether they are proceeds of corruption, whether they are proceeds of money laundering or whatever it is. Again, there must be some legal framework that is able to cut across both countries and using that legal framework, you are able uh, to have those assets uh, recovered and repatriated to countries where they were actually stolen from. It is vitally important that we strengthen the APA in that <clears throat> Africa, like any other part of the world, must also be seen to actually actively participate in fighting international crimes. Uh, offices of the DPPs across have also to be strengthened through legal frameworks whereby these offices, in as much as they're supposed to be independent, and even if they are interdependent with the other agencies, their sovereignty must be recognized because an office of the DPP that is under the beck and call, possibly of the executive, is not likely to discharge its duties the way it's supposed to be. 
there are always grumbles, especially from the politicians, that such offices are used to try and uh, execute a political vendetta. That the executive would want to muzzle its opponents using offices like this. Therefore, it is important in every country, constantly we look at laws that relate to this office, which laws must be strengthened, and you are always accorded the independence that you are supposed to have so that you are able to do your duties and interfered with. It is for this reason that Africa must come together. We do not always have to look upon Europe or the Americas to come to our aid. Some of these issues, we can actually solve them ourselves and we are able to move forward in the right direction with our own initiative. I know for sure there are challenges um, that you are faced with and one of such challenges is going to be conflict of laws because laws differ from one country to the other and sometimes some of these laws are brought about through international conventions and uh, some countries may not be prepared to uh, accede to those conventions but for the sake of combating crime and uh, having prosecutions that are effective and the uh, prosecutions that are uh, well-meaning so that they are intended to achieve what they are intended to achieve it is important to look at these international conventions. It is important to look at domestic laws so that these are harmonized and to a greater extent, especially in Africa, we are able to use them. There may also be conflict of interest, the, the agency of the DPP having a conflict with possibly other investigators of crimes like in Kenya, we have the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, which also deals with the investigation of crimes. But the sole role of prosecuting in our country is vested by the Constitution in the DPP. Yet we constantly come to the defense of the DPP to say, while other agencies can actually investigate, the role of prosecuting must always be executed by that office. Uh, <clears throat> other challenges that you're likely to come across are border conflicts. Um, in one country, there may be conflict going on and that is that becomes a haven for criminals to go and hide there as that country is not stable as that country goes through the turmoil again this is an issue that possibly you will have to look into so that at the end of the day we have a seamless flow of uh, prosecutions cutting across the continent as envisaged by the 34 countries that are represented here so with those many remarks Mine is to wish you very well in the Republic of Kenya, in the coastal town of Mombasa. Um, please do enjoy the seminar to the fullest. Have very fruitful discussions, useful discussions, discussions that are going to help our continent in one way or the other. We look forward to hosting you again when that time becomes necessary and where possible, remember also to invite us to come to your country if such an event ever takes place there. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Have a very good day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Honorable um, Murugara. Uh, we, we thought it was important for us to share part of um, <clears throat> Kenya's um, experience uh, in terms of how do we work within the, the Constitution. And I think uh, you will agree with me that Honorable Murugara has tried uh, not only to invite you but also to impart a bit of knowledge on how Kenya operates within its Constitution and how the Constitution is framed to be able to protect uh, the Kenyan citizens. And, and, and one of it is the uh, independence of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, I have one more person that I would want to invite. And again, it's just about us Kenyans trying to share uh, our um, um, uh, legal framework. 
Within our legal framework, we have what we call the Witness Protection Agency. Uh, and I felt maybe it's important for us to try and bring it out. And I've asked, kindly asked uh, the Director of Witness Protection Agency, and her name is Madam Jedaida Waruiu. Uh, she's uh, a colleague. Uh, and uh, together we share a lot of commonalities. Uh, we, we've gone to similar trainings, but we also are uh, holders of the Jurist of the Year in Kenya. So I want to invite Madam Jedeida Warimu to just take us through very quickly and for five minutes what Witness Protection Agency is, how it operates within the legal system of Kenya. Um, so welcome, uh, my, my dear colleague. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable uh, DPP. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. My chairperson, Honorable Murugara, uh, where also the Witness Protection Agency uh, is oversight at the parliament. Allow me also to welcome you to this uh, session. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time that the Witness uh, Protection uh, Agency has participated in a session like this, uh, this 16th annual African Prosecutors Forum, and therefore it is uh, a great honor to be among you as uh, distinguished uh, prosecutors. Um, as has been said, uh, Kenya has an existing framework, the Witness Protection uh, Act, which came into force in 2006, and uh, the agency was operationalized in 2011 after we had a constitutional change in 20, 2010, 2010. So when DPP was provided and given its independence and autonomy by the people of Kenya, so was the Witness uh, Protection Agency released from the, the, um, the DPP, which was under the Attorney uh, General. Uh, it's an honor to have uh, the DPP invite us here because the DPP is one of the advisory board members of the Witness Protection Agency, which has a number of um, the members in the criminal justice system, uh, including the judiciary, the national police service, the uh, Kenya prison service, among others. The chairperson of the advisory board is uh, the Solicitor General, who is under the office of the Attorney General. Uh, the Witness Protection Agency is a very important uh, infrastructure in the administration of justice because um, the judiciary, the prosecution, the police uh, services, and other actors, the Kenya Prison Service, need uh, the services of protecting witnesses who are vulnerable. And the Act provides a very important framework for this country, which has helped uh, the country in terms of uh, ensuring that we're able to deal with the uh, crimes and also uh, ensure there is a prosecution. Some of the critical components of the agency is that we protect people who have uh, crucial information uh, and who are cooperating with the, act, uh, with, the law, with the prosecution and other law enforcement agencies. And we have uh, referrals from uh, the anti-corruption, from uh, DPP themselves, from the police, from the Policing Oversight Authority, uh, from the Kenya National Commission, among others. The agency has been able to develop its legal framework over time. The act, which was of 2006, has been amended over four times to strengthen the agency, to ensure that it's autonomous, to ensure that uh, its services are practical, effective, and efficient. And also, we've gone further and developed regulations to strengthen the same rules that are very specific to the judiciary to help judicial officers to be able to work uh, much more effectively with the Witness Protection Agency. Last year, we developed a regulation that is going to provide reciprocal arrangement. So when uh, Muesh Mua speaks about that Africa needs to come together, we are at that point at, uh, as the agency where we are saying that as Africa, as Africans, we need to be able to reciprocate where you're able to uh, provide protection across border, vice versa. So the service is only for threatened and intimidated witnesses and uh, their, their associates or families. And this is really 
the last uh, resort uh, where those uh, opportunities arise in court, in tribunals, in commissions, or uh, in inquiries. I want to say two things before I, I end. Some of the things that we have done to ensure that we strengthen the whole regime of witness protection is to develop a special curriculum on witness protection, and it has three special modules, one for prosecutors, one for investigators, and one for judicial officers. Because those three actors in the criminal justice system are very, very important. And therefore, as we sit here and hear about the training of prosecutors in the training academies, we are very keen on that because we need to work together and ensure that we are able to provide that very critical service. You're not here at the Witness Protection Agency uh, at, the, uh, at round tables, at conferences a lot, or even at press conferences, but we are there with you to ensure that you're able to uh, succeed as you prosecute the transnational organized crimes, among others. The benefit about the Witness Protection Agency is that it has learned from ourselves. We learned a lot from South Africa, and I'm happy that the, the, pro, uh, the prosecutor from South Africa is here because we were incubated through uh, the Witness Protection Agency in South Africa. Lastly, as I end, I think um, let us see how we are able to communicate, we are able to collaborate, that we are able to coordinate more and complement each other in uh, the services that we provide. And I do know countries like Nigeria, Ghana, Mozambique, uh, uh, South Africa, as I've mentioned, Ethiopia and Morocco have uh, some form of legislation and it's important for us to spur that. Our vision is to ensure that as we come together as Africa, we have an association of witness uh, protection uh, uh, actors so that we are not beholden to the, uh, the European, for example, the Europol, which usually provides the technical support for, for, for Kenya. We are able to come together and work together. Allow me to ref uh, reflect on the words of the African Union anthem, which says, let us dedicate ourselves to fight together for lasting peace and justice. Let us all unite and toil together to give the best we have to Africa. Let us all make Africa the tree of life. So we ask you uh, later today, we are going to be having a side event uh, to where we will discuss more, share more about what we do and encourage you to work, we work together to build each other's uh, infrastructure within their various countries so that we can harmonize in terms of how we manage and uh, deal and combat transnational crimes using the witness protection infrastructure. Thank you so much and God bless you. Um, thank you. I'm sorry for having uh, interfered with the uh, Madam Shamila's pro next program, which is the second session, uh, and I have the honor of calling um, Honorable Advocate Shamila Batoy uh, and the second session group to come up uh, and, and start. We will adjust the timings accordingly. I think uh, we are about 15, 15 minutes, uh, 20 minutes late, but we can, we can adjust accordingly. Thank you very much. Sorry, maybe I should have called out the rest of the presenter. There's presenter Marco Letizi. Is it, or is it you who call? Should I just call them up? Yeah. Um, then there is uh, Mr. Kaba Mohammed, Prosecutor General Guinea. Mr. Saitoti Maika, Director General uh, FRC. Advocate Gideon Nkoana. SCCU Regional Head South Africa, Mr. V Victor Mule, Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, Kenya. Thank you very much, uh, DPP, and good morning to everyone. Um, 
So before I introduce the topic that we're going to be talking about today, the trends um, with regard to illicit financial flows, I think I should just say one thing, that witness protection is hugely important, but as, as various states, we should also be looking very, very carefully at whistleblower protection, because we cannot deal with these cases if you do not have whistleblowers who blow the whistle, so to speak, and they need a lot of protection. And so there's a whole lot of issues that we are contemplating in South Africa around that. Um, so I think that's hugely important. And then I just want to pick up on what um, the DPP said um, and the Honorable Chair of the Parliamentary Committee that oversees um, the prosecuting authority. We have a similar system in South Africa. And I want to say that um, it's hugely important that Parliament that represents the people. So reporting to Parliament is actually reporting to the people of the country. And it's important that prosecuting authorities are held accountable to the people through Parliament. But what we found in South Africa is that even our Parliament in the days of state capture failed to do uh, proper oversight over the prosecuting authority. So even though we have these oversight bodies, it's really important that these bodies do what they need to do and hold us as prosecuting authorities properly accountable. And so the independence issue is important. Perhaps at our next APA, we can have the theme as independence of prosecuting authorities and deal with that because many of us have fantastic laws relating to independence, but the de jure uh, independence is not enough. There must be de facto independence of prosecuting authorities as well. So with that slight, um, those, uh, those remarks on the side, it now gives me pleasure to, to open this session, um, which deals with trends um, in dealing with financial crimes. And I'm going to very briefly um, introduce the panel. We are under time constraints. We have the presenter, Mr. Marco Letizzi, um, who's a lawyer, public account, accountant, a statutory auditor, and advisor of the European Commission, Council of Europe, and the UN. Um, we're very pleased to have you here to do the presentation to introduce the topic. Uh, and then the panel discussions, we have Mr. Kaaba Mohammed, Prosecutor General of Guinea. We have Mr. Saitoti Maika, Director, Director General of the Financial Reporting Center in Kenya. We have Advocate Gideon Nkwana, who is the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions and the Regional Head of the Specialized Commercial Crime Units in, in South Africa in the National Prosecuting Authority. And we have Mr. Victor Mule, who is the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions in Kenya. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be dealing with various trends in understanding illicit financial flows. And as we all know and as we've heard, illicit financial flows diverts funds from, we're, well, we're dealing with Africa primarily, to other jurisdictions, hampering development in our continent um, and impeding growth and, and making it very, very difficult for many of us to achieve some of the UN sustainable development goals. So it has a huge impact on our countries. So as we talk through this and listen to the various types of initial financial flows, I want to say that in order for, for monies to flow through our countries, there has to be enablers that actually do this. So it's not just about the person committing the crime, the predicate offense. It's about those professional enablers that enable funds to flow. And who are these professional enablers? They are bankers, people that live very, very, um, um, sort of, um, you know, they don't, they're not the, the, they don't have the profile of criminals, but they are fueling criminality so much in our, in our continent that we need to look at how do we deal with bankers, lawyers, all apparently upstanding members of society, bankers, lawyers, accountants, politically exposed persons, estate agents, someone comes and buys a house for cash, you know, how does that happen? So we can deal with the criminals, um, but these are also criminals that are fa facilitating 
um, illicit financial flows and destroying our, our continent. So as prosecutors, we need to look at how do we focus on those enablers. So we, you know, with those very few words of introduction, I'm going to now call upon our, um, our speakers. We are running slightly out of time. So if we can stick strictly to our time frames or even shorter, I'm going to put an alarm on my phone. It will ring and you'll know you then have two minutes to conclude. Thank you very much. The first speaker that I call upon um, is Mr. Marco Letizzi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, firstly uh, thank the project leader of AML CFTSK project, Mr. Frederick Bayard, for having brought me here. Before becoming an international consultant for international organization, I have been working as colonel of the Italian Guardia di Finanza. I don't know who of you have ever dealt with this highly specialized financial police. And as colonel of Italian Guardia di Finanza, my primary objective was not to put in jail criminals. I say, Marco, what are you saying? We are all judges, prosecutors here. You are reporting yourself to the judicial authority? Yes. Actually, of course, my task was to put in jail criminals. But my primary task was to seize and confiscate their financial and economical resources. So my first task was not to put in jail criminals. My first task was to cut out their financial resources. I had been spending all my, all my life, 30 years, to counter criminal organization and mostly mafia type organization. You know why Mr. Bayard called me, asked me to come here? Because probably, because I'm Italian? Yes, but says Marco, not because you are Italian, you are here. I say yes, because I am from Italy. And Italy is a country, one of the country who has the most deep expertise in countering criminal organization and mafia type organization. You ask me why? Because we have been exporting for centuries mafia all around the world. So we had to be very, very, very good in countering mafia. And from my personal, ex professional experience on the field, let's say that when you cut out the very head of a mafia type organization and you put in jail the leader, you haven't solved anything because he will continue to send orders from the jails and or at least there will be another one who will take over his position into the, within the organization. So, what have you done? You have just uh, put someone uh, in, uh, in a structure that is already very full of people. <laughs> so, my, uh, my message today here is we have to change our mindset. Uh, as international consultants, I've um, been traveling all around the world, helping developing countries and emerging countries in strengthening their, uh, their structure, their governmental agencies in countering organized crime, mafia-type organization. And what I found out, there are several criticalities that I want to share with you. 
First of all, a lack of culture. Why? Because most of the countries continue to focus on a traditional paradigm to counter serious crimes. And which is this paradigm, this traditional paradigm? This traditional paradigm is founded on the ordinary, cri ordinary criminal confiscation scheme. You have an offender, you have a criminal conduct, and you have the price, the profit, and the product of the crime. And you have that etiological connection between the offender, the, the criminal conduct, and the profit, the price, and the product of the crime. So, what do you have with the ordinary criminal confiscation? You have a snapshot of the present. You have already everything on the table. You don't need to go deeper into things, because you have everything on the table. But uh, we all know that this traditional paradigm has its limits. And which are these limits? The limit is that we cannot go back to the past. Everybody of you remember the famous movie, Hollywood movie, Back to the Future. Well, this time we have to go back to the past in order to reconstruct all the hidden, long-standing uh, financial and economic resources that criminals have accumulated over years. And how do you do? How, how do we do that? Going beyond the traditional paradigm. Going beyond the traditional mentality. Giovanni Falcone was one of the Italian prosecutors who was murdered by Sicilian Mafia in 1992, he said, money never fails. Money trail never fails. People can fail, but the money trail, the money trail never fails. So let's follow the money. The follow the money methodology is crucial in countering organized crime, mafia-type organizations. So, to go beyond this traditional paradigm, we have to exploit further investigative methods. And I am referring to extended confiscation and non-conviction-based confiscation. I appreciated very much what me Mr. Michael sang told before about financial investigations and all the efforts that Kenya is doing about this uh, typical issue. And I also appreciated what the director of asset recovery of Tanzania, Mr. Farai Chimbi, told before about parallel investigation. I think he uh, meant um, parallel investigation when he referred to parallel investigation he wanted to probably mean uh, non-conviction based confiscation. So, confiscation is the primary tool to counter transnational organized crime. Okay. First point. But the method is through financial investigation. This terrific, penetrating, investigative tool that can lead us back to the past that can uh, bring us beyond the snapshot of the present. Going around at the global level, I highlighted, so I uh, identified several criticalities. The first one is the lack of mentality. So, as I said before, focus on the traditional paradigm. The second is a lack in the, the legislative reform. 
most uh, many countries have in their legal frameworks just the ordinary criminal confiscation and the value-based confiscation as a, a, can I say, derivation of ordinary criminal confiscation. Some countries have also the extended confiscation with several legal prerequisites that allow you to identify those assets that are not etiologically linked to the criminal conduct and to submit them to the judiciary or to the competent judicial authority for the seizure in view of final confiscation. And few countries have also the non-conviction based confiscation that in its turn as other legal prerequisite, several of, the, of, of, of them are shared, are the same of the extended confiscation. Few of them are uh, typical of uh, non-conviction based confiscation. So first criticality, the, a lack in the, in the mentality, in the culture. Second uh, criticality, um, a lack in the legal framework a poor legal framework. Third, capacity building. The law enforcement agencies involved in, country, in, uh, in conducting financial investigation, in countering uh, uh, serious crimes, uh, most of the times have not the sufficient technical expertise to conduct autonomously financial investigation. What I want to say, it is incredible that the country does not have a financial police that can autonomously, independently, conduct in financial investigation. What I see most of the time is a police who goes to the, uh, Mrs. Ms. Shabila before uh, uh, referred to enablers, correctly I say, and very interesting insight, they go to the enablers, to the ba commercial banks, lawyers, legal firms, to get the documentation, and they bring the documentation on the desk of the public prosecutor. Say, my job is done. Distinguished guests, it is not the way. It is fundamental that every country will have a highly specialized financial police which can autonomously, independently conduct the financial investigation for the very first step to the very end. Another lack is uh, the, um, another criticality is the lack of IT infrastructure. If you want to run an effective financial investigation, you have to uh, um, have um, the availability of um, an, an efficient data management system. You cannot read hundreds and hundreds of pages taken from commercial banks. You cannot find the financial discrepancies that are red flags for the identification of criminal assets or criminal assets within the brackets, as, I mean, criminal assets, if they have an illicit origin or unjustified asset from an economic and financial perspective. Anyway, those assets that you will submit to the judiciary authority for the seizure. So you, uh, for having an efficient and effective asset recovery system, you have to conduct effective financial investigation and this financial investigation shall be uh, 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 supported by an efficient IT infrastructure. So a data management system, and I am working on it. I am working on it. I am working uh, in order to provide each country of a specific, a specific uh, data management system that can uh, allow the, the competent law enforcement agency to 
massively acquire uh, the, the data from the, uh, uh, um, from the institutional stakeholders and sort them, automatically sort them uh, and, uh, for, the, for, the, for the financial analysis. Um, but also in terms of domestic interagency cooperation, I would say that the IT infrastructure is also uh, the availability of updated comprehensive databases interoperable each other, that can dialogue each other, and the possibility to establish a unique digital platform that will store all the data from all the databases, okay, and um, all these data can, can be, of course, uh, uh, um, available to the law enforcement agencies. So, with one click, you can say, Marco Letizzi, who is Marco Letizzi, uh, uh, who is a, a criminal STR's background, uh, uh, he is a personal and business network, and so. So, I'm going to uh, end. So, I'd like to thank you very much. I would say uh, many, many things more. Thank you, uh, thank you again for uh, having me here, and uh, good luck to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Letizzi, for that uh, overview. And I call upon Mr. Kaba Mohammed, Prosecutor General of Guinea, to say a few remarks between five and seven minutes, please, PG. Bonjour, Mesdames et Messieurs. Je voudrais avant tout repos remercier Monsieur le Directeur des enquêtes publiques de la République de Kenya pour l'accueil chaleureux qu'ils nous ont réservé depuis le début de cette session. Alors, le thème qui nous réunit donc ce matin s'intitule donc sur comment comprendre les tendances des flux financiers illicites. Alors, pour pouvoir comprendre cela, puisque nous savons déjà que parmi les catégories de flux financiers illicites, nous avons le blanchiment de capitaux et le financement du terrorisme, Donc, sur la projection que j'ai entamée, il s'agit de montrer quelques cas concrets du processus par lequel ces flux financiers illicites, notamment le blanchiment de capitaux ou le financement du terrorisme, peuvent se présenter. Ainsi donc, Afin d'abuser donc de l'économie nationale, les criminels se réinventent à travers un certain nombre de systèmes, parmi lesquels nous allons comprendre qu'il y a des acteurs qui sont vulnérables. Et parmi ces acteurs, nous avons donc décidé de parler des organismes à but non lucratif. Et parmi donc ces organismes à but non lucratif, nous constatons que certaines organisations à but non lucratif font un abus des fonds qui leur sont destinés en finançant le terrorisme. Et ces organismes à but non lucratif également profite des fonds qui sont alloués aux organismes pour détourner les dix fonds à des vers des destinations, notamment le financement du terrorisme. 
Alors, après ces organismes à but non lucratif, nous avons un autre secteur d'activité qui est très vulnérable, ce sont les institutions financières. Alors, ces institutions financières, comme nous le constatons souvent dans nos pays respectifs, ces institutions financières sont assez vulnérables dans la mesure où nous allons voir sur notre séquence qu'il y a des opérations personnelles et à travers ces opérations personnelles qui sont faites au niveau de ces institutions financières, il y a la possibilité de faire du blanchiment de capitaux. Également, nous avons les établissements de crédit qui permettent le blanchiment de capitaux. Et enfin, nous avons les acheteurs de métaux précieux qui profitent donc de l'achat de ces pierres précieuses ou métaux précieux pour encore faciliter ou accomplir un blanchiment de capitaux et éventuellement financer le terrorisme. Mesdames et Messieurs, ces cas concrets que je viens donc de décliner constituent des enjeux très importants pour nos sociétés. Comment mettre fin au blanchiment de capitaux Comment arrêter le financement du terrorisme Je vous rappelle que je suis de la République de Guinée. Une partie de l'Afrique de l'Ouest qui est confrontée à un problème de terrorisme accru. Nous sommes frontaliers avec la République sœur du Mali. Alors vous comprendrez aisément pourquoi j'ai mis l'accent sur le financement du terrorisme et le blanchiment des capitaux. Mais avant de terminer, permettez-moi également de parler un peu de l'expérience guinéenne. Depuis le 5 septembre 2021, en République de Guinée, un nouveau vent s'est levé. Ce vent de changement a décidé de mettre la justice au cœur de tout le système. La justice est donc devenue la boussole qui devra orienter la plupart de toutes nos actions. Et pour concrétiser donc cette boussole, il a été mis en place une cour de répression des infractions économiques et financières. Et donc, au niveau de cette cour de répression des infractions économiques et financières, nous avons tiré l'expérience des pays voisins et d'autres pays pour créer le double degré de juridiction au niveau de cette cour. Puisque dans la plupart des autres pays, il s'agit de pôles économiques et financiers avec un seul degré souvent. Et après, ça tombe dans la cour d'appel et avec tous ceux que nous connaissons de lenteur. Donc au niveau de notre pays, nous avons donc décidé de créer donc cette juridiction spéciale. Et à côté de, donc, de cette juridiction qui nous a permis en un temps record, au bout de un an d'activité, nous avons pu recouvrer au moins plus de 50 millions de dollars. Vous comprendrez aisément que et hier, donc, je n'ai pas voulu parler parce qu'il s'agit pour des personnes souvent qui sont soupçonnées de détournement de biens publics, de corruption. Souvent, avec, euh, nous avons eu l'agréable la, la plaisir de comprendre que certaines personnes ont décidé to even if it's not a public so some people decided to pay back this uh, money and uh, so we we have a fund that allows us to uh, continue the fight uh, against uh, 
um, uh, embezzlement of funds, uh, corruption, and so on. And uh, in um, short, I will, these are the kind of experiences that I would like to share with you. Thank you very much. much PG for those experience in your country briefly and thank you for sticking to the time um, can I now call upon advocate Gideon Nkwana from South Africa you are your excellencies uh, invited guests ladies and gentlemen good morning um, as time is, is a luxury we don't have in abundance, I will utilize this opportunity to share with you some of the measures we, have implem we are implementing in South Africa to address uh, the problem of illicit financial flows. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, Illicit financial flows are alive and kicking in South Africa like in any other country in Africa. This is because mainly of our geographic position as a financial hub in the Southern African region. And then we are experiencing a large outflows of monies and also a, a large inflows of monies. Now, to address this issue of illicit financial flows, South Africa has decided to implement certain measures which I'm going to share with you. Uh, firstly, we have implemented what we call an interagency working group on illicit financial flows. Now, this is, what, this is a multidisciplinary setup which is spearheaded by our financial intelligence unit, the Financial Intelligence Center. Now, in this group, we have got a large number of law enforcement agencies represented. This is agency is a coordinating forum for illicit financial flows. It has been mandated, it has been mandated as an interagency structure of several South African government agencies tasked with collaborating to task to tackle the issue of illicit financial flows as it relates to the South African jurisdiction. We have got regular meetings of this group and we have developed a working definition of what these illicit financial flows entail. We define illicit financial flow as the illegal movement of money or capital from one country to another when the funds are illegally and transferred or utilized. So the definition therefore, ladies and gentlemen, covers various aspects relating to the movement that is legally and such as trafficking, fraud or theft, and legally and but illegally transferred that will be related to the contraventions of uh, exchange control regulations. We have developed a case selection criteria to work on. Now, the cases we, we are selecting, they must fall within the definition of the illicit financial flows. They must have a minimum financial threshold of 100 million rent, and then it must involve a minimum of three investigating agencies. Now, has this intervention worked in South Africa? The answer is yes. Since the establishment of the Interagency Working Group on Financial Illicit Flows, 
we have managed to track at least 15 cases, uh, totally in amount of 1.5 billion rent. And since its establishment, we have also made recoveries totaling 400 million rent. Now, we have also established an inter, inter, uh, anti-money laundering desk within the NPA. Central to the establishment of this money laundering desk is the realization that money laundering is one of the measures used to transfer illicit funds abroad. Now, represented on this money laundering desk is various uh, specialized units within the NPA, ranging from my unit, Specialized Commercial Crime Unit, the Specialized Tax Unit, um, the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit, and uh, Organized Crime Unit. Now, these are all specialized units. Now, this is a clearing house of all uh, suspicious transaction report we receive from 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 the from our financial intelligence unit. Now we we, we allocate cases as and when they are they come to this various specialized unit. Now, in, 19, in 2019, we saw the launch of the South African Anti-Money Laundering Inter Integrated Task Force as a public-private partnership between the banking sector and sector regulatory authorities. Now, SAMLIT is aimed at enhancing collaboration and coordination in combating financial crime, money laundering, and terrorist financing. The other intervention we have put in place to support efforts to recover assets. South Africa is a member of ARINSA, the Asset Recovery Interagency Network for South, Southern Africa, which is a regional multi-agency informal network that aims to assist prosecutors and investigators working on cases involving the identification, tracing, and freezing, seizure, and confiscation, and recovery of proceeds and instrumentalities of crime. Now, the other intervention we've, I've just mentioned, I've already alluded to, is we, we cannot overemphasize the issue of specialization. Uh, illicit financial flows take time to be investigated, and uh, it, it needs specialization. Specialization on the part of prosecutors, investigators, and the asset for future uh, unit, which is uh, responsible for tracing assets. Now, that is the, 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 the mechanisms we have, the, 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 the institutional, institutional frameworks we have implemented in South Africa to address the issue of illicit financial flows. What are the challenges we are currently facing in South Africa re relating to illicit financial flows? Our country has porous borders, and uh, the phenomenon, crime phenomenon we are currently experiencing in South Africa is bulk cash smuggling. Now, the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation, that is our police mandated to investigate this type of offenses, have instituted a project to try and arrest this uh, bulk cash muscling among our land borders, primarily. Thank you very much. That, that is those, uh, those are the uh, uh, interventions I was uh, trying to share with you, which we are implementing in South Africa to arrest this issue of illicit financial flows. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Advocate Nkwana, for that uh, high-level overview. What I should say in South Africa is that we are, uh, you know, we are really now pushing with the non-conviction-based asset recovery. Um, you know, court cases take a long time. 
and so to really deal with non-conviction based and we're really trying to have a very clear strategy and resources to to really vigorously deal with that um, so mr victor muller um, the deputy director of public prosecutions kenya the floor is yours Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to give a brief presentation uh, on Kenya's experience uh, with respect to illicit financial flows. Uh, the outline of my presentation uh, within the seven minutes will cover the domestic legal framework, the institutional framework, the domestic policy administrative and administrative uh, framework, the relevant international framework, uh, our threats and vulnerabilities, and some select uh, cases. Uh, this presentation uh, will be provided to the participants, so you don't have to write in lightning speed because of the time uh, limit. For purposes of this presentation, we are going to adopt uh, the definition that illicit financial flows refer to the illegal movement of money or capital from one nation to another. Uh, so the key words are that uh, the funds are illegally obtained, the funds are illegally moved or moved using illegal means and they are utilized for illegal purposes in the recipient uh, uh, country. The legal framework in Kenya can be clustered into three, the criminalization, institutional police and regulatory framework. Uh, under this category I would, uh, I would include the Central Bank of Kenya Act and the Banking Act then international cooperation, mutual legal assistance and extradition and then such uh, warrants. Uh, the most common way through which illicit financial flows takes place is through money laundering. Kenya has enacted uh, the process of crime and, uh, and money laundering act, which does a number of things, criminalizes money laundering, provides for reporting institutions and their obligations, creates several agencies, the asset recovery agency, the financial reporting center, and the and money laundering advisory board. It also provides for asset recovery, establishes the asset recovery fund into which all assets recovered are deposited and makes provision for international cooperation. That is the definition of money laundering which is there. The act also makes provision for supervisory bodies through fi which financial transactions take place and where illicit financial uh, flows might also take place including uh, the Central Bank of Kenya, the Insurance Regulatory Authority, the bedding control, capital markets, and others. There is a definition for reporting institutions, which including includes all financial institutions and designated non-financial institutions. There is also provision for non uh, for designated non-financial and business provisions, which are all their casinos, real estate, priv uh, precious metals, uh, dealers in precious stones, accountants, NGOs, and the like. There are several obligations of reporting institutions, key among them being to monitor on an ongoing basis all complex, unusual, and suspicious large cash transactions. They also have an obligation to uh, verify customer identity, establish and maintain uh, customer records, establish and maintain journal reporting mechanisms, and the register with the financial reporting sender. There is also provision for accountants because they also deal with cash. Uh, the functions of the FRC have not provided them. The Director General of the FRC is here. I don't want to intrude into his territory. territory. Uh, we have functions for the ARI which include criminal forfeiture, confiscation, and the civil forfeiture, production orders, and the like. Uh, we also have other acts uh, like the Prevention of Terrorism Act, which has also got 11 provisions on illicit financial flows. Uh, the, pro the Prevention of uh, Organized Crime Act, which has also got relevant provisions. They are all provided in the presentation. Uh, we also have the Penal Code, uh, which comprises of offenses, uh, all manner of offenses, uh, uh, stealing, theft, forgeries, thefts, and the like. And there is a provision for forfeiture, which is conviction based uh, upon conviction of an offender. 
Uh, we also have the ODPP Act, uh, which has established the office of the DPP, and the OPD, uh, under the Act, the office is mandated to conduct further proceedings after conviction to recover proceeds. The Evidence Act provides for investigation of accounts uh, and the like. The Criminal Procedure Code also makes provision for the power to issue a such warrant. In terms of international cooperation, the main legal framework is the Constitution, which, amongst other things, provides that any treaty or convention ratified by Kenya forms part of the laws of Kenya. We have two extradition laws, we have a mutual legal assistance uh, act, and we also have a transfer of prisoners act. Uh, one of the best practices I, I can share with participants is that Kenya may render mutual legal assistance even in the absence of a treaty. But for extradition, extradition is treaty-based uh, process and a, a treaty is mandatory. There are different types of assistance that a can, a Kenya can render and they are all listed under the Mutual Legal Assistance Act. Under the policy and administrative framework, uh, we have regulations on beneficial ownership and the, C, the Central Bank of Kenya has also issued numerous uh, prudential guidelines on the regulation of financial institutions. The insurance regulatory authority has also issued prudential guidelines. Uh, these are the uh, company's beneficial ownership uh, information regulations which were formulated last year. These are the, so some of, uh, in terms of Kenya's experience, uh, according to a study, Kenya has been losing an average of US dollars 330 million. The main threat is local and international businesses. Other forms are mis of, uh, illicit financial flows are misinvoicing, transfer pricing, trade in contraband goods, corruption, trafficking in persons and drugs. Why is Kenya vulnerable? It is because mainly of cash-based informal system, weak banking regulatory, low levels of compliance by banks. I will give a few examples of cases. You will see uh, compliance is low are uh, inadequate mechanisms, non-transparency in the banking uh, sector. Uh, what has Kenya done? Uh, we are a member of SAMLANG, uh, which is a fative, uh, like uh, body uh, uh, we, to which Kenya has been subjected to mutual evaluation. And I'm going to talk about the recommendations by the mutual evaluation team shortly. So Kenya was evaluated in 2011 and 2022 and uh, SAMLANG issued the recommendations. Some of the recommendations are that, are that uh, Kenya has made improvements in AML, CFT. Uh, Kenya has not demonstrated strategic policy to prioritize investigation and prosecution ML. Uh, what the report says is that there is uh, uh, the, uh, stress on the predicate offenses as opposed to man laundering. Uh, there is also a report that uh, Kenya has not investigated or prosecuted legal or, or natural person for terrorism finances. Well, I have put it in red because uh, I have information that we have done so. Uh, so, vulnerability, some of this is because of the geographical position and the economic development. Uh, we are a regional hub in terms of economic uh, regions. We have neighboring countries with active terrorism, uh, terrorist groups. Uh, we have uh, as transactions which are conducted through the Awala system, uh, cross-border currency movements, and the like. Other threats are, we are, as I have said, we are a global leader in mobile financial uh, services. We have heard about M-PESA. Uh, factual assets and factual asset providers are also not are prohibited and they are not uh, uh, regulated by law in Kenya. Uh, these are some of the select cases. I will just mention them in passing. 30 seconds. Uh, these are some of the some of the cases. Uh, the first one is NYS National Youth Service. These uh, are training institutions for the youth. Uh, it's a, 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 an example of grant corruption. Uh, it involved fictitious invoices, forgery of invoices and the like. One of the invoices, just to mention, uh, was for US dollars 90 
thousand and the calculation after calculation by investigators it meant that one of the recruit consumed 66 kgs of beef per day uh, which is uh, not normal then we also have the issue of commercial banks uh, on the an example of reporting obligations and liability of legal persons we are due to the NYS scandal we charged uh, uh, some banks uh, due to for violating uh, reporting obligations, we entered into deferred plea agreements and they paid empty fines. Another case uh, is the agro leasing, uh, uh, which is a good example of beneficial ownership. Uh, the owners of these companies were, no, uh, were not known, were not undisclosed. Uh, a total of US dollars 770 million was involved. Another case is of an MD and a politically exposed person on a, of a government parastato in the energy sector. Uh, they, opened, uh, they opened a shell company in a tax open uh, through which they received bribes. Uh, the bribes we negotiated with the tax haven country and they were repatriated in Kenya. The other uh, example is the Golden Bucky National. Uh, in which also is a case of politically exposed person using shell companies. Uh, a commission of a, a inquiry established that uh, politically exposed persons had hidden monies uh, through nominee relations. Uh, we also have a case of ethanol smuggling which is used to make illicit uh, uh, alcohol and a company has been charged uh, for possession of ethanol worth uh, US dollars 10 million and possession of uh, fake revenue stubs worth US dollars 372 million. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm told my time is up, but I've, as I have said, the presentation will be provided uh, to the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm terribly sorry to my panelists here. I'm the ogre that's trying to keep them to time. Um, but we are running, uh, and I'm, I'm going to take my guidance from the organizers in terms of whether we have time for one or two questions. Should we? Yeah, one or two questions. Okay. Can I have a uh, show of hands to anyone that would like to ask the panelists one or two questions? Um, please, can we have here the mic to the Honorable DPP? In the front, is anybody else? So we can just get the mic to you whilst the first yeah, speaker is. is uh... <coughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I thought I have four panelists. Did I miss out any panelists? Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Maika. My sincere apologies. Um, yeah, I, can I please call upon you to to conclude? Um, Mr. Saitoti Maike. Thank you. Uh, distinguished prosecutors, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, Shamila have given me 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my colleague from Kenya has literally uh, shown you how we do the business of prosecuting illicit financial flows. But just allow me uh, to enumerate the centrality of an FIU in uh, fighting illicit financial flows. Uh, in particular, uh, our Kenyan context. Because at the end of the day, yesterday I said that uh, prosecution and conviction of criminals is not good enough. What is good enough is taking the process from criminals. And the establishment of an FIU is basically based on the requirements of FATF in which there must be a central depository of suspicious transaction reports which must be analyzed and then disseminated to law enforcement. In the Kenyan context, the Financial Reporting Center, which is the FIU, has been created by a statute that's called Process of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering Act, which criminalizes money laundering and other related offenses and provides measures for combating financial crime. It also does 
uh, state certain obligations for financial institutions to undertake to combat illicit financial flows. And uh, the same same Pokamla also establishes uh, an asset recovery agency which is mandated with the, 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 the work of uh, uh, recovering assets as well as a criminal asset uh, recovery fund. The mandate of the FRC is threefold. One, we avail information to investigate agencies, supervisory bodies, and other bodies to facilitate the administration and enforcement of the laws of the Republic. We do also exchange information with other similar bodies in other countries regarding money laundering activities and related offenses. And I'm very sure the uh, majority of the countries in sub saharan Africa, we've interacted quite well in that front. And we also ensure compliance with international standards and best practices in AML measures. Let me just expound on each of the, those in details. And first, FRC is a central repository of all reported information. STRs, SAR, CTRs, and uh, cross-border cash declarations. And basically, uh, these forms the basis of our receiving an analysis of uh, information that is refined and then we produce an intelligence report product that is submitted to law enforcement uh, for action. It is this information that uh, gives the basis now for investigation of IFFs. And uh, uh, this is very, very important uh, as part of an FIU's work and, and is actually the beginning of, of, of identifying IFFs. Uh, due to the central position in the MLCFT system, FRC manages a huge database uh, of all the reports that are, are submitted uh, and also other reports that are obtained from other sources and registries, public registries. We are thus in a very advantaged position to unmask uh, complicated paper trail of criminal activities and other beneficial owners of criminal assets, either in form of uh, real estate and, and the rest. This allows us to provide to law enforcement with information that it requires uh, in a timely manner to enable them to identify and trace illicit assets. Uh, as an FIU uh, in our republic, we have access to all the public databases with the exception of the land registry, which gives us the latitude to identify beneficial ownership and ultimate beneficial ownership, which is very, very crucial in tracing uh, proceeds. But for us, we have a very, very unique uh, provision of the law in Pokamla that literally gives us all the powers that uh, are necessary for the expedient execution of our work. And that is section 18, which basically says that we have access. It overrides any secrecy imposed by any other law. So basically, we can request any information from any government agency without restriction. That section in itself gives us unfettered access to all the information that we require. And again, within the provisions of Pokamla, we also have uh, the right to enter into MOUs. And this facilitates exchange of information without going through the MLA process, which is quite tedious, long, and at times it can also be challenged in, in, in court of laws. Again, Kenya is party to the ANCAC, the UN uh, Convention Against Corruption, and we facilitate the return of assets to comply with ANCAC through the powers under POKAMLA, which allows FRC to share intelligence with any foreign FIU and other law enforcement agencies across jurisdiction. The advantage is our MOUs, uh, powers to enter into MOUs, extend beyond FIUs. We can actually enter with any competent authority which define in any jurisdiction as law enforcement. Uh, this proactive sharing of intelligence with other counterparts in other countries have not only allowed us to trace assets that have been translocated abroad, but also allows prosecution of suspects in those jurisdictions where our legal authority uh, is not applicable. Uh, in the recent past, we've seen developments in improving uh, that statute in which FRC was given uh, powers for temporary uh, freeze of transactions for a duration of uh, five days, excluding weekends, so technically that is seven days. Uh, this powerful weapon can give law enforcement an important lead to be able to move to court and, uh, and apply for preservation orders, conduct uh, interrogations, detain suspect, and can as well also uh, support uh, the issue of searches without delay. Uh, 
we are thus able to facilitate the timely exercise of law enforcement powers in support of asset preservation for purposes of forfeiture and classification. But again, as we do all this, you do all understand the nature of IFFs. Either they are cross-border or even they are very, very complicated in nature. And uh, what we've seen and what we've exp experienced is that there are a lot of challenges that come in and even impede our work more. Uh, for us, the area of new technology has really created a big challenge, particularly in the identification of uh, illicit financial flows, the whole linkage of fintechs into our financial system, the, the, the issue of new technology related to virtual assets. We don't have a law that covers virtual assets. We don't have a law that regulates virtual asset service providers. But again, you'll be surprised that uh, we are one country that is in all this. In 2020, the Singaporean FinTech Association did a global survey. And Kenya was ranked the first in cryptocurrency peer-to-peer -peer trading. And we were fifth in terms of uh, the volume that is traded in cryptocurrency. So again, you find that as we battle with all these, we are facing challenges that we are not able to surmount because of new technology. Again, like all of us, the issue of law enforcement capacity, there is a total mismatch between the staff I have in my FIU and the guys who receive our products in the, in the Director of Criminal Investigations. It becomes a bit of a challenge, and that's why uh, the Deputy Director indicated that in our report, it, we realize that we are, pre, we, are, we, are, we are prosecuting the predicate offense, but you do very little on the money laundering uh, arena, because basically law enforcement has those challenges of converting intelligence into evidence where it's related to financial flows. Uh, again, the issue of skills, of course, uh, Law enforcement always have that challenge of having the right skills. It's quite expensive to train some of these staff, but again, looking at the size of a police force and the size of an FIU, you expect that. The issue of resources, basically we are more or less operating on IT platforms, which requires uh, licenses which are quite expensive, subscription to external databases which are also quite expensive, so that, that's another challenge. Uh, the issue of prosecution, the slow pace of uh, justice, it's a cross board, and at times also what we've seen in the recent past is the issue of jurisprudence that courts have come up with, which also impede our work. Uh, lastly, the issue of our stakeholders' capacity, financial institutions, there was also a mismatch on the levels of the Tier 1 banks, Tier 3 banks, so you find that what happens is when criminals realize that Tier 1 banks are very difficult to abuse, they move to the banks or the financial institutions that don't have the capacity to be able to identify these uh, financial flows. Uh, thank you very much. I think my time is up. Uh, and I will be open for more questions if need be. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm told that we do have time for two or three questions. So if we could, the colleague, if we could bring the mic to the front and if I could, um, if you could indicate uh, if anyone else wishes to take the floor. Okay. Our colleague on the left, far, well, on my right, on your left. Um, is anyone else? Okay, we can start with our colleague in okay, the front. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Deng Ashville, Director of Public Distribution, South Sudan. Uh, my comments and question goes to Mr. Marco. Uh, who touches most of the uh, challenges to our uh, country, South Sudan, in terms of financial flows. Uh, in case of uh, lack of judiciary reform, uh, confiscation identified of assets, capacity buildings, uh, and financial police investigations. What is the role of the general uh, Shampa auditor uh, in case of the public uh, embezzlement funds. So this goes to him. Ismi Tahir Abdurrahman, Rais and Niaba Alama B. النيابة العامة السودانية أشكركم لتحت هذه الفرصة والشكر يمتد لكل من تقدم 
بأفكار ملهمة فيما يتعلق بموضوع استرداد الأموال القير مشروعة ومن خلال متابعته لهذا المؤتمر أجد أننا قد اتفقنا جميعا على أن مسألة استرداد الأموال قير المشروعة يعتبر And in our country, in my country, after the the revolution that happened in 2019, there are there are some cases that were opened by by the by the DPP, and some countries refused refused to cooperate with us for to give information or even to seize the the properties that were acquired illegally, and therefore. My question is why why can't we make what I make this uh, this uh, uh, this union the first step no, towards uh, towards cooperation towards cooperation and on a very on you know, clear principles for us to, uh, to cooperate how about uh, recovery of assets uh, that have been obtained illegally thank you very much was there a third hand your colleague from Uganda and those will be the questions colleagues and then we we'll, panelists can take them whoever <coughs> wants to deal with any question thank you my name is uh, Suleiman Muhammad the uh, I am the Attorney General of Somalia I uh, first of all I'm uh, I, I thank the uh, TPP Kenya for hosting us in this beautiful city of Kenya uh, I, I would like to discuss uh, and, and, and say something about the uh, combating illicit uh, financial flows in, in, in Somalia. Uh, I agree with Marco uh, the, the, ch the challenges uh, he raised in terms of poor legal uh, framework, capacity building, lack of financial uh, police uh, forces and uh, I, poor IT infrastructure. Uh, in, in Somalia, we have uh, established FRC, Financial Reporting Center, which is mandated to trace the financial illicit crimes in the country. Uh, we have also uh, have enacted uh, anti-money laundering and financial uh, terrorism law in 2016. Uh, but still, as uh, the panel uh, raised, there are a lot of uh, challenges in terms of the issues that the Marco raised in terms of all these things. But still, uh, uh, there is uh, a relationship between uh, the anti-money laundering, uh, combating and terrorism financing, and the rule of law of the country. If there is a, a weak rule of law and supremacy of law, then the issue of uh, combating financial terrorism and uh, anti-money laundering issue is, will not be successful, as we think, and for instance, FRC, uh, we have established FRC in Somalia in 2016, and still uh, uh, we couldn't uh, prosecute any financial case in, in, in Somalia as we're facing uh, challenges in the area we, 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 we raised, uh, the panel raised here. But still, I, I, I want to ask the, the panel. Uh, uh, we have raised uh, politically exposed persons and how we can monitor or uh, we can make special monitoring of the activities they are doing. If, if, if there is a weak political, uh, if, if there is a weak uh, rule of law in the country, how we can prosecute and make accountable to those politically exposed persons? Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, colleague from Uganda, did you have a hand? No? Yes or no? Okay, but I'm, I see there's another hand there. 
but I'm going to ask you please to make your points very succinctly because we're going to break for tea now and we still have the panelists to, to respond. So if you could please make your points um, crisply and succinctly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shamila. Let me just be very, very brief. I just wanted to, um, uh, either the panelists or even members in the House, Uganda has two challenges. One, we don't have a standalone law on asset recovery. And then number two, we are, it is conviction-based. So we find that most of the time we, our hands are tied. Most of the cases have gone on appeal. So I just wanted to share uh, if some uh, members in the House or the panelists can give us uh, and share a way forward. How do we go about that? Because we cannot, uh, but we are in the process of uh, changing both, but it takes so long. That was my comment. Thank you. I can just respond very quickly to you, Sis Jane. You have to convince your political principles to fast track it through the, through the system and your parliament um, to change the law. So, um, panelists, is there one more? I can't see who it is. If we could have it very quickly, please. Uh, thank you. It's the last one. Well, merci bien. Je vous remercie de me donner la parole. Je commence par remercier sincèrement la haute autorité de la République du Kenya qui a invité le Mali à prendre part à cette importante rencontre. Il s'agit de Monsieur le Directeur des poursuites publiques. grateful for the invitation and to be in Kenya where we were well welcomed and received and we are grateful also to the organizers of this conference allowing us to participate here we realized that it was important for us to be here this morning in line with the theme that we have followed, we were able to hear the panelists and uh, we have been taught of a good number of interesting things, i.e. the idea on uh, how to absolutely change the mentality of criminals because uh, it is not only a matter of uh, confisc confis confiscating the goods, but we also need to go to the criminal camps and try to fight them vis-a-vis -vis their strength. And with this, according to the presentation of Mr. Marco Litizzi, from the beginning of the year 2000, there was a structure that was put in place in my country to fight economical and financial crimes. And now we have tried to do an evaluation, an assessment, uh, which we have realized there is great failure because there is a parameter or parameters that were not exploited or used and that has put us at a place where today we are changing strategies because uh, we have uh, put in place a national strategy now that we are calling national financial pool and we have a challenge and the challenge is about how this new structure will be a success because if we come back on a failed strategy and we start afresh, we need to be concerned uh, of the failure. And the presence of Marco Lutizzi here allows us to take advantage of this meeting in order to strengthen our knowledge and start from a better place. And uh, we, this will help us to start a better journey towards success. And I have realized that the brave intervention of Marco Litizzi 
does not allow the, the time allowed to him does not allow him to share more i'm asking has he made some publications can he share with us the references or the links so that we can have them why not physically we can even look for them online if possible this is a precise question to you sir because what is happening today here is uh, going at the heart of financial uh, inquiries and investigations. Uh, we need to have financial expertise uh, that will allow us to follow up on very solid questions for the prosecutor. If the case is not solid, we are beginning by failing already. And we don't want that, Mr. Marcos Litsizi. Thank you very much for your good intervention. And I want to thank all members of panel for your sharing, but I want to take advantage of uh, Marcos. Thank you. All colleagues, I'm going to ask the panelists to, to um, maybe just respond uh, to questions, but I'm going to go through maybe each of you to give you two minutes or so to respond. Can we start with anyone who wants to volunteer? Um, Edgar Mkwana, please go ahead. Do you have a, a mic? I think there's a mic. Uh, yeah, so we can just ask the mic. Thank you, Ed. Hello. Um. I would like to respond to the question relating to the recovery of assets obtained illegally and, and the lack of cooperation from countries. Um, my, my take on this is that uh, we shouldn't be having such a problem in, in Africa. My view is that uh, the African Prosecutors Association has a valuable role to play in ensuring that African countries especially adopt regional and international standards to, uh, in developing mechanisms to facilitate the exchange of information between countries to prosecute cases involving uh, illicit finance flows successfully. Now, it is the purpose of these gatherings like this to see to it that uh, we have all the necessary cooperation to share information relating to the recovery of assets as well as sharing information relating to the prosecution of cases. Now, coming to the politically exposed persons and the monitoring of their actions, I think uh, the answer can be found in some of the FATF recommendations. And uh, I think the banking sector has a prominent role to play in this regard, as well as uh, the financial in, uh, uh, the FIU is for a particular country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who would like to go next? Please go ahead. I'd like to thank you, uh, all the friends present in this room, um, for their very interesting intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing my. We have the same ideas. You know, we are on the same page. When I speak about asset recovery, I always have a holistic approach. I always have a holistic approach because you cannot address just asset recovery, you know, the tracing, the identification, the seizure and confiscation of criminal assets. But you have also to speak of asset management because you cannot have a successful asset recovery phase if then you don't also have a successful asset management phase and vice versa. These two phases are intimately connected. 
in the majority of the cases I see governments just focus on the asset recovery process. You have to focus on the asset management phase as well. Because you have to, uh, as, uh, uh, criminal assets, seize and confiscate assets, are a resource, are not just a problem. Until we consider confiscated assets from organized crime just as a problem, we are not going anywhere. And we are failing also, we are we will lose also economic and human resourcing in countering serious crime and in seizing and confiscated assets in the previous phase of asset recovery. So, where are, in which way we are going to allocate, we are going to destinate, we are going to uh, 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 destinate the confiscated assets? That's also a crucial point to think about. Confiscated assets from organized crime, not just a problem, but as an institutional, social, and economic resource for the governments. Take a building and give to the community as a school for the children. That's a sign. Mothers who accompany their children to that building that was an asset, a criminal asset, that belonged to the criminality, that in that territory, Ruled. That's a sign. So, I agree what, uh, on uh, what our friends uh, uh, said before. Asset recovery is another crucial uh, um, um, issue, but it is it has it should be addressed along with the asset recovery issue. Okay, you cannot. I can split the two aspects. It is a whole aspect, a unique aspect to be addressed. Thank you very much. I just want to emphasize the importance of asset management. I mean, in South Africa, we've, seized one of, we've had one of our biggest asset forfeitures. We've seized the optimum coal mine, which is a mine the size of Singapore. And it has been, as far as managing that, it has this, I mean, I can, I can do it. Yes, sorry. Um, I must take this off. Thank you. I think let me take this off. Yeah. So just ma managing that process and you know the various stakeholders, we can probably do a whole lecture on that. But it just shows the importance of asset management after the forfeiture. Um, colleagues, um, anyone wants to take the floor? Please. Go. Uh, thank you. Just allow me to respond to the issue raised by a colleague from Somalia on the issue of politically exposed persons. You agree with me that uh, it's not that easy to deal with the uh, politically exposed persons. But again, politically exposed persons are not really a problem until they exert certain influence for things to be done the other way around. And the uh, point to note is that there's no offense called politically exposed persons. Once he's done that, then that politically exposed person becomes a criminal, and you deal with that person based on the provisions of the law that deal with the offense that is committed. But again, uh, our colleague from South Africa did mention the issue of the gatekeepers, the financial institutions being in the front of almost everything done by politically exposed persons. So a lot of emphasis should go into enabling the financial institutions to deal with the risks from politically exposed persons. And uh, basically, uh, that entails the whole issue of having more or less uh, risk management systems that are able to determine whether a customer or a beneficial owner is a politically exposed person. If they're able to do that, then enhanced due diligence on their transactions will kick in. The whole issue of adequate measures to establish the source of their wealth and the source of funds which they are transacting. The issue of uh, uh, obtaining information on their families, immediate associates, and uh, entities that are related to them. And uh, by and large, uh, basically, uh, a review of public sources of information on PEPs that enable them to really understand this clan from that uh, particular standpoint. And of course, 
making sure that it's in statute that they have to do that. Because the moment it's not explicit, then you create loopholes that are likely to be problematic for the reporting institutions. And then, of course, he's already said that the FIU also plays a very, very central role in ensuring that information is available on PEPs. But by and large, at the end of the day, all of us work for governments. And these politically exposed persons are more or less people who are within the system. So political goodwill becomes very, very crucial in dealing with PEPs. And that one, I don't think there's a classroom where we can be taught how to build political goodwill as public officials. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much. I've been given the marching orders to now close the session, so I'm sorry to my other colleagues. Please feel free to engage with the panelists, but please join me in thanking all the panelists for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the DPP South Africa, I don't think I have even the, uh, the mandate to give you marching orders, but thank you so, so much for, for, for keeping time. Um, I think now we have uh, earned uh, a break, a health break, coffee break, but before we can be able to take a break, uh, just a few things which I need to make a reminder. Uh, the upper registration is on, there is a desk which has been set out uh, outside.